Welcome everyone. My name is Robin Shooter and today it is my enormous pleasure to be speaking with with Kevin Lockray. Oh, I practiced that before. Did I get that right, Kevin? You did. You did. <laughs> we were okay. actually having a chat before before we hit record about how to pronounce Kevin's name. So it's Kevin Lockray. Um, and Kevin, so we we had uh, a little bit of a, a correspondence on email just around the, the fact that my sub stacks to you were ending up in your spam folder. And then I can't actually remember how it was that that I came to. That's right. That's right. When you replied, you said that some of your emails um, – in regards to Clintel, were also marked as spam. And my ears perked up and I said, oh, you're involved with Clintel. Do tell me more. So that's how we came to be having this conversation today, which is about um, climate change, anthropogenic global warming. I suppose it's gone through a number of different, you know, name changes and branding changes and different organizations that have picked this uh, this football up and carried it further down the field. So I... Um, if you if you wouldn't mind, I'd I'd like you to just open with explaining to to my audience uh, what your background is and what what gives you the the what why should they listen to you? Okay, what gives you credibility to speak on on this particular topic? Okay, well I I graduated from the Royal Military College Duntroon, uh, and I attended two lots of staff college, which ran over one and a half years. A staff college is like a final year of university for people who already have a qualification. Uh, and then I did the senior management course in the United Kingdom as well. But more importantly, and most probably pertinent to what we're talking about, I actually studied uh, for a Bachelor of Applied Science, which then morphed into a Bachelor of Engineering in Mechanical Engineering. And in my last year, I had the enormous pleasure and I suppose uh, luck to study under a terrific guy called Roger Porterman. So if Roger's listening to this, he's he, he would most probably be in his 80s by this stage. I just want him to know how much I owe him. Uh, Roger was my teacher in thermodynamics. And um, we uh, focused in my final year on, you wouldn't believe it, but steam and hot gas. And as a, as a consequence, um, because of my training in thermodynamics to the highest level possible in university, um, when this happened, by the way, when I, I went along and saw Al Gore and an inconvenient truth, and I came away from that believing what I'd seen because I didn't, I didn't really go to the pitches to be, you know, to, for a scientific treatise. I went there to be entertained, and he was very entertaining. He was very um, persuasive too, yes. I yeah. Um... I remember watching that that film and and thinking, oh my god, you know, this is an impending catastrophe. What yeah. on earth can I do? Yeah, yeah, and and um, it was to my great surprise that I started to come upon writings from people I respected who were pulling holes in the presentation. And like all good sophistry, what you see in Inconvenient Truth is actually a mixture of truth and fallacy, and the truth, you know, like. This happens in your in in everyday life. If you're going to school and your teacher is teaching you two and two make four and a whole lot of other plain truths, and then the teacher slips in something about how you know Australians have massacred Aborigines or something like that, as a student you say, "Oh, oh that must be true because my teacher said it." And if the teacher mm. says, uh, "You know, carbon dioxide is warming the atmosphere." Or that uh, the way that a greenhouse works is it traps UV, uh, ultraviolet, sorry, I'll get this right, uh, infrared light, you, you know, unquestionably accept it. Mm. But once I got into thermodynamics, and especially the second law of thermodynamics, I started to think, hold on a second, that, that just doesn't work. You know, you, you can't trap infrared radiation because infrared radiation will warm something up only to the extent that it is warm uh, and even if it's bouncing backwards and forwards it's not going to warm it any further that's the second law of thermodynamics and in reality and then later I found out that someone had taken the time to build a greenhouse with uh, made out of would you believe salt and salt allow clear salt it allows you allows infrared radiation to go in and out of a construction and they put a glass greenhouse next to the one that was made of, of with salt paints and they both achieved exactly the same temperature 
which meant that it's not the trapping of the infrared inside the greenhouse which causes the greenhouse to become warmer. It's the trapping of the air, e.g. you're pushing energy into a, a space and the energy can't escape until the temperature rises to a certain point where then the energy entering equals the energy exiting. Gotcha. Makes sense? Okay. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And, and these were the things that, that happened. So anyway, look, yeah. I then went off and, and did 32 years in the Army, and I, I learned, I started, in fact, I, I ended up in an area called combat um, support uh, and, and operation support and so forth and combat development and I was receiving highly sensitive documents from the Office of National Assessments. And it started me thinking, look, if I was a full colonel in the Chinese People's Liberation Army and I was in such a cell, now, I, to, to put everybody at ease, the focus of our thinking was how could we improve the lot of our neighbours? Because our thinking was, look, if our neighbours like Indonesia are prosperous and happy, they have no need to come down here. And if oh, we're and trading with them yeah, freely, yeah, yeah, yeah. We're yeah, an like asset make, to them. Kind of like make make love, not war, right? You know, exactly, trade, exactly. Um, you know, Whereas the Chinese really aren't thinking along those lines. The Chinese intend by 2049 to have hegemony over the world. They are autocrats. It is, in fact, the Chinese Communist Party is a criminal cabal masquerading as a government, and you have to get that through your head. They, where's, they, where's, uh, the, now, I'm going to, th throughout our talk today, I'm going to play devil's advocate, both sure, on the, go, the go climate stuff and, and this. So what 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 is the uh, what is the source of knowledge for that claim that, that you just made, that, that well, they wish to establish hegemony over the world? And, and what I'm doing right at this moment, just by the way, if I, in fact, I'll turn off my mobile phone. The, my mobile phone just made a noise and I'll get rid of that. I should have done that before we started. Um, yeah, look, the re it's actually written, it's stated, 2049 is the 100th anniversary of the Chinese Communist Party taking control mm -hmm. of China. And it is their stated and written aim that they will be the supreme world power by 2049. That's mm -hmm. stated. It's out there, black and white. If you if you should doubt me, just Google it. <laughs> and I, I normally don't recommend I, Google because it's a font of a lot of propaganda. As oh, it hides. To, yeah, to it, it's actually truths. a hiding hiding agent rather than a search agent. But, um, yeah, no, I, I have heard these claims made before by uh, a number of uh, people either within the military now or, or ex-military. And uh, I've also heard counterclaims. So... You know, I'm 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 big on epistemology. You know, how do we know the things that we know? And I guess you know, when I ask you these questions, I'm also encouraging my 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 listeners and my viewers to ask these questions and and to get into the habit of looking for source material and following up on source material when when it's given. So, um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you know, providing some some of the reputable links that you know of for uh, so that I can include that in the show notes, that would be fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I'll, so I'll make a note of that. Excellent. All right. So, um, so that's what you were doing in the in the army. Um, yeah, and and that's most probably made me or, or or structured my thinking to always be very suspicious about anything. Mm -hmm. And I I question. I'm you know people call you could call me a skeptic, but I I think I'm a skeptic on steroids. I always feel <laughs> that if things are yep. going well, I'm work, walking into an ambush. Um, right, 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 and that's not. And that's just part, by the way, that's part of the yeah. uh, infantryman's prayer. If, if uh, friendly fire isn't, and uh, if that's incoming friendly fire isn't, and if you're walking into an ambush, if you walk, if think, if your attack is going well, you're in an ambush, um, and and so that's how my thinking runs. And so I always worry about anybody who's bearing gifts uh, unsolicited, um, and so coming back to where we were at the. If if I was in the People's Liberation Army and my superiors had said, look, you've got to do everything you can to destroy the Western hegemony so that we can be the supreme power of the world, I would look at gifted idiots who were running around claiming that carbon dioxide is destroying uh, this planet, and I would back them. Now, but human beings often see things in binary, and that's because our life is like that. For example, when you're growing up, it's usually one person who's giving you a hard time, and therefore that one person is your enemy. 
But in real life, there can be many players. All of them are your enemy. That is to say, they're working against your interest, but they're working to a different agenda. For example, the people in the WEF are working towards a global power, a global government, in, in the belief that that will get rid of wars. It will also make them fabulously rich and important and powerful. That's convenient, isn't it? Yeah. And then there's a, there's another group that believes that everybody in the street are idiots and that they're not fit to look after themselves. Democracy doesn't work. The only way you can run a society is that you have some gifted people at the top making this all the, the decisions. This is the Plato's Republic. This is the Plato's Republic model. That oh yeah, yeah. I've read the history of Western philosophy when I was thirteen years old, and my my big brother gave it to me. I was totally captivated by it. And in there is Plato's Utopia. Yes, yes. Uh, and, and so and, the, the, and that, the plebs are too stupid to make decisions for themselves. Yeah. And so you have to have this, well, you know, what we would now call a technocratic class. Yes. Uh, that that is very knowledgeable and, and wise and will arrange things and run the affairs of all the plebs and then they could just go and do pleb things and, and uh, you know, their, their affairs will be well managed by by their superiors. Um, do you, it's interesting, so you drew a distinction there between what, what you think uh, or how you think the, the, the WEF views us plebs and and how this this other group um which you didn't give a name to i don't know if you have a name for it but i um ev everything that i hear coming out of the mouths of the wef indicates to me that they think we're stupid rubes and that we are too dumb to manage our, ourselves so so i'm i'm curious as, as to that distinction that you drew between you know the the wef WEF faction, this other faction that, that just thinks we're, we're, we're morons and kind of rank our own affairs. And then, and then on top of that, you've got the United Nations. And the United Nations, in a large part, is driven by envy. A large number of the nations that are part of the United Nations, instead of standing back and saying, look, the reason we have problems is because of our own ineptitude, our own corruption, and so forth they look at the developed nations and say they got all of that by exploiting us. And so it's our turn. We we should have, you know, we should get it. It's envy. Um, mm. Now, I, I, I suppose, you know, the the counter to that would be to say that, I mean, I know it's the case in, in many, many African nations, for instance, that, that they have um, extremely abundant uh, fossil fuel resources. Actually, I, I, I Let's just bookmark that because I want to come back to to this idea of fossil fuels and see where you're at on that. But anyway, so there are many African countries that have abundant resources of oil and coal and natural gas and whatever, and they're actually being prevented from developing those for for the benefit of their economy and their citizens. So I think there's also that faction. Sure, there 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 might be a a um, there might be a faction within those countries that that has sort of glommed on to to Marx's principles. You know, we were oppressed; they're the oppressors. You know, we we want to take their stuff. But then there's this other faction that says, well, actually, you know, we don't really buy into that narrative at all. But we're sitting on, in many cases, a literal gold mine in this country. And yet, you know, these these people who want to rule the world are telling us, oh no, you can't pull that coal out of the ground and and use that to generate electricity so that you can lift your people out of poverty. Uh, we're instead going to, you know, go. We're going to pay you to either leave it in the ground or pull it out, but you have to send it to Europe so that they can use it, but you can't. And we're going to set up wind farms and and solar farms for, so so that you can you can stay poor and and you know have every have two out of the three of your of your children die before they reach the age of five. So there's uh, there's a lot going on in 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 this geopolitical structure. Yeah. Now everything I've just said may not be perfectly correct. What I'm trying to you know convey is that there are numerous bodies within the world who have a different agenda, they're motivated by different things, mm. but all of their actions will help the Chinese Communist Party. Mm -hmm. And the history of every revolution is that once the revolution is complete, once it reaches that stage where the progenitors feel they have achieved their objective, they then exterminate all of the useful idiots, the facilitators who help them get there. So yes. in other words, all of the people in the WEF, all the people in the UN, all of the people who are out there on the street who are influencers, probably you and I line up there, are 
we're, we're going to be loaded onto cattle trucks and sent off for, to become organ donors or whatever. Okay, that is what lies ahead unless we get a grip of this. The next part of this, and I have to I have to expose myself, is I actually do believe that the person in the street has a lot of sense. And I think we saw that with the voice referendum. The odds. Yeah, yeah. Were it's very right. encouraging for me. And Go ahead. Voting yes, because, voting no, rather, because every large business, and that tells you something, collaborating with government, which, by the way, is fascism. That's the very quintessential definition of fascism. That's the big how Mussolini described it. Yep. And poured hundreds of millions of dollars into the yes vote. And yep. yet the person in the street had enough sense to say, oh, hold on, this, there's something that just doesn't work here. It doesn't yep. make sense. Yep. And so I have I, a lot yeah. of confidence. If we can only get a democracy going, which is actually run by the people rather than by politicians, I have uh, the, the nature of government is that it will accrue unto itself ever more power at the expense of the citizen. Be wary of that. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I could not agree more. And, 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 and yeah. which I have on this very matter, and I won't. We're here to talk about climate, but you want. Yes, to we're, we're, we're here to talk about climate now. Now, I know, I know you've um you've prepared some uh some some presentation slides, and I'm really looking forward to getting into this. I I wanted to say uh uh like my like you, you know, I went and saw that Al Gore film and was shocked and horrified, and I actually. Uh, never really questioned the anthropogenic climate change narrative until until COVID. Now the whole COVID thing stank to high heaven for to me from the get go. Uh, right. I not for one moment did I think, oh, this is a this is a deadly virus, and we're all going to you know be, be at risk from it. And locking down is absolutely the right strategy. From the moment from the the absolute get go, my uh, suspicion meter was was in the you know beyond the red zone. Wherever you go beyond the red zone, it's like yeah. this this just absolutely stank, and because. I was curious to find out, you know, what on earth is going on? Who's behind this? I, you know, I, I had some initial thoughts, but um, as I began pulling on threads, I discovered a number of people. And what you mentioned before about how teachers establish credibility, or generally this is the way it works, right? So authority figures establish credibility by saying some true things, then they throw in some false things. Well, it's also the case that that if if some source of information is generally right on a number of issues, then when they express an opinion on an issue that you have a different opinion on, you know, for me at least, I'm inclined to say, huh, Someone who's been, uh, someone who's got a pretty good track record on these other issues is challenging my point of view. I'm not going to dismiss that. I'm going to look into it. And that's how it was for me with climate change. So um, as I began, you know, pulling on threads with this, the, 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 there were a couple of things that really struck me. First of all, it was who was behind the whole climate change narrative and once yep. i found out this might be in your presentation but once i found out that a certain fellow by the name of of, of, of morris strong um was really integral to the formation of the ipcc and and just drove that whole climate change narrative and you know he of course made his made his fortunes in the um alberta oil patch um and was a a protege of was it David or Nelson Rockefeller? It was one of the Rockefellers anyway. And so he cycled in and out of making money out of oil and then pushing the climate change narrative for decades. <laughs> and and then and then um uh faced charges because of the uh the uh oil for food scandal. And so he fled to China where he lived until shortly before his death because it was was it his sister? It was either his sister or a cousin. Um, had been like this with with, with Mao. She'd actually been his live-in lover. And once, once I read Funny that story, that, I was like, it? "What on earth is going on here?" It, 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 so, so, yeah, that was my initial moment of saying, "I don't know." Like, th this smells fishy to me. So then I began digging into it more and finding people like Tony Heller and um, um, and even you know the writings of Bjorn Lomborg, who does 
appear to to believe that that anthropogenic cli- uh, climate change is happening. But then his point of view is more: well, the policies that are supposed to fix this are absolutely not going to do that. They're they're, they're just going to impoverish and immiserate people. Anyway, so that was a very long winded um, explanation for me of, of how I got interested in this. And and so, yeah, let's. Did you want to go ahead and and, and launch into your presentation? No, but if I can just say I really enjoyed that because uh, you're right on target and I didn't mention Morris Strong, um, but, but that story is really complex. I mean, there it's not just him. It, it, it's, it's really evil. And the fact that he fled to China tells me something as well. And you may have, and, and by the way, I, I wasn't expecting our conversation. This conversation, by the way, listeners, is in no way rehearsed. So uh, I didn't realise that you were going to take me in that direction, but what you've just done is demonstrate how everybody's everybody who is wicked and evil in this world is all inter interwoven. Uh, yeah, and some yeah, people they all end up they all end up in the same sewer. The right thing. <laughs> That's right. Track them down by the stench. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so listen, I'm um, I'm, I'm going to share the screen. Can can um, I'll. I'll go I'll to. I'll let you know when that comes up. Okay, uh, I'm going there now. I hope share. Okay, how are we doing? Can Perfect. You see? Yep. Excellent. Then let's let's start from the beginning, and we'll be talking. Uh, start. By the way, before I even start, this is open source software for the viewers. Uh, I spent from 1997 to about 2005 traveling the world promoting the use of open source software as a means of accelerating the development of nations less fortunate than ourselves. Mm -hmm. And if I was ever to get into parliament and be influential, I would uh, advocate that the Australian government should get behind this and support it because it would allow us to develop a truly indigenous software industry in this country. At as I'm sure, as I'm sure you know, Kevin, uh, that is the direct opposite of the approach that government is taking. Exactly, um, and instance, they're fed, you know, as fascists will be, with Bill Gates and Microsoft. Oh, the schools, the schools have contracts with Microsoft. Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So anyway, this is open source software. You're looking at it right now, and you'll find it's really easy to use. My wife. This used- is actually um, uh, Impress, correct? Yes, correct. LibreOffice yes. Impress that I'm using. And yes. it's all free, guys. It's all free. Yes. Uh, and this, I, is what I, this is what I've been using for some years since I decided software. to part ways with uh, with anything that Bill Gates was involved in. So, yes, folks, um, LibreOffice, it's great. It's got your Word equivalent. It's got your PowerPoint equivalent. It's got your um, Excel equivalent, and it works great. So, good. <laughs> Excellent. Let's uh, let's let's get this bus on, yep. on the road. Robin, by the way, I would love to come back on at some later date and wax philosophical about all the things that we could do to make this country great. And when I say great, I mean make those most vulnerable prosperous and secure. Anyway, well, let's move into this. Okay. This, is, yes. this is the driving motivation at the WEF UN level. Um, and, and you can see we, the UN IPCC, joined at the hip, redistribute mm. de facto the world's wealth by climate policy. One has to free oneself from the illusion that international climate policy is environmental policy. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. Now, look at that face and tell me that that isn't a, you know, a self-important prig. Mm. Oh, that's the that's the, that's the classic smug technocrat face. I'm just um now I, I'm sure most of my viewers and listeners are aware of this, but uh, so the IPCC is the international uh, uh sorry intergovernmental panel panel on climate change. Is that, is correct. that correct, Kevin? Yeah, correct. And mm, um, which which uh, again was uh so uh, Maura Strong, who I mentioned before, was was one of the uh the the driving forces of that. So um I think I think um. Everyone's favorite. Um, um, I was going to say something rude, but I won't. Everyone's favorite uh, climate change guru, Greta Thunberg, s- said something um, very similar to this recently, which was something about you know uh, climate change policy is all about ending capitalism. So there you have it. I mean, th- these are not one-off statements. You really, really do need to get this through your head. This, this has. I mean, look. 
it's straight out of his mouth. This has almost nothing to do with environmental policy anymore. I don't see how he could make any clearer what this climate policy is really about. So great. Um, yeah. yeah. And and if I it, you you press a little button of mine there, there is a big distinction between capitalism and free enterprise. Yes. Capitalism. If you read um, Benito Mussolini's doctoral thesis, uh, I, I think it was about 1938. Uh, I could be wrong there, it might be earlier. Uh, he actually explains how capitalism is the vehicle for Marxism, that you end up with what he called corporate socialism. You're mm -hmm. able to morph into... Now, Hitler also was something of a fan of that, and that uh, uh, Mussolini came up with the word fascism, and Hitler embraced his ideas. That's why they became bosom buddies. The idea... Mm -hmm. Fascism is that big business will get into bed with government, as will the unions. The unions are an integral part of big business. And you saw that with the Transportation Remuneration Tribunal, which Labor tried to launch. The whole idea of that was to destroy the small owner operator and benefit the IPEX and Lin Foxes and so forth, who are heavily unionized. And in the end, you end up with the government big transport organisations and the unions charging the public whatever they think they can stand. Yeah, Forget this, about is, this is uh, it's actually crony capitalism, isn't it? Yeah, it, it it's not, it's not it. free enterprise. And that is Marxism, yeah. by the way. Yeah. Eventually, everybody has to put on a suit or a pair of overalls and punch their clock every morning and you will work for the man. And, and by the way, that is the death of a society, and, and that's part of another presentation that I could give at some later point. Okay, there was a question asked about carbon dioxide and its effect on the atmosphere, and the first clue to this is that the black line is the CO2 and the blue line is the temperature taken from ice cores. They're able, through the ionisation of atoms in the ice core, uh, or molecules, they're able to determine what the temperature was. And of course, they're able from the trapped CO2 in the ice core to, to have some indication of how much CO2 is in the atmosphere there. Now, as a scientist and an engineer, I know for sure that ice bleeds. It, it doesn't hold it forever in its pristine state. But what you're getting here is the trend. The trend is right, okay? The bleeding is less as you come closer to zero to the present day as you take mm, so, it. So just, just to be clear, what, what you're saying is that if we go back to, to say, the Cambrian period, those yes. levels of carbon dioxide were, were likely higher than what oh, is much, indicated oh, by the much, Yes. Okay. Exactly. Okay. It's mm. even worse than what is shown here, 7,000 parts mm. per uh, million. Uh, mm. It is quite likely that there that the parts per million were higher. Now I I may be wrong here too, by the way, and I'm happy to admit it, in that scientists may have taken this to an into account when they did their calculations. I can't be sure. But right. but I just wanted to say to the listeners that the trend is important and which one can be fairly confident about. And what it shows you is that there's no relationship between the temperature of the earth and the carbon dioxide levels. And in fact, when the blue line goes up, the, the black line lags behind it. The black line comes up after the blue line goes up. And when the blue line goes down, the black line then goes down later as well. Yeah, okay. what, what you're saying is that, is that atmospheric carbon dioxide actually follows um, temperature. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That it does not drive it, yeah. I, I wanted to, just something that I wanted to comment on too. Oh, actually, well, it's relevant to this slide as well, um, which is, you know, um, I, I remember reading about the, uh, the 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 Cambrian explosion. This this huge proliferation of of you know, life forms during this period in history. So so for those who are who are saying that these rising you know quote unquote rising levels of, of atmospheric carbon dioxide that we're seeing now are going to result in mass extinctions. Uh, when I first saw a temperature chart, or, or sorry, a CO two chart similar to this, I what immediately struck me is well. <laughs> How how can uh, how can high levels of carbon dioxide be so inimical to life when this Cambrian explosion took place during this period of incredibly high by by out by standards today incredibly high um, atmospheric carbon dioxide? Yeah, and and th what I'm showing you here is this is when plants first came first were discovered. They're, they're taken from fossilized remains. By the way, grasses were later. We'll get to grass next, but you'll notice. That and I wonder if I can move my cursor 
Um, can you see my I can, I can see your yeah, I can see your pointer there. Oh, this is just too good to, for words. You'll see that it drops. And that's when, if you look over here, that's when trees first appeared on Earth. The mm -hmm. trees are eating the carbon dioxide, just like rabbits eat grass. Mm -hmm. And you end mm -hmm. up with Right. You end up with a sparse brain land in the end. Well, well, the trees did all of that, and then it's yeah. So what you're up. saying is, is is that the 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 CO two was in the atmosphere presumably because of the metabolism of of the more primitive life forms, and then the trees come along and the trees start to uptake carbon dioxide, so it's no longer in the atmosphere; it's in the trees. Have I got that right? A, a, a little bit. In that, carbon is one of the most common elements in the universe. And this earth was born with lots of carbon. And okay. when and we also blessedly ended up with water and oxygen. And we had a heck of a lot of heat. So the carbon in the earth burnt to create the carbon dioxide. As to how life began on earth, that is the subject of another presentation. And it's all guesswork as to yeah, you know, yeah. the heck. So many something. different theories about that. Um, the the yeah. the sort of the interstellar exactly. ones are pretty fascinating. Yeah. So yeah. we want to go there. All we can say is it is interesting, and the theory could be that because plants evolved on Earth somehow, uh, the carbon dioxide which was in the atmosphere, most probably as a consequence of oxidization of the carbon, um, was eaten up by the plants and it dropped down. Mm, okay. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, you'll gotcha. notice yep. over on this side that it drops again. And the reason for that is the earliest sperm records of grass pollen are from the Palocene of South America and Africa between 60 and 55 million years ago. And you can see over here that it starts to drop. Mm. So the, we, we've, we've ended up with low levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere because of the plants. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, and, now yeah. get, getting from the millions to the thousands, as a consequence of two ice cores, one taken from GISP2, which you can Google and learn all about, and the other from the Ip Ipica Dome C, we've been able to establish that the atmospheric temperature was doing something akin to what you see in the top graph, namely there's a downward trend, you notice near right where zero is, which is where you and I are sitting, it goes up again. But that's not going up in any way that it hadn't gone up in the past. Yes, that's, you can see that clear pattern of fluctuation. Yeah, and we'll deal with with that later on. But you'll notice that carbon dioxide is going up from about two hundred and sixty to two hundred and eighty during the, this process. So mm -hmm. carbon dioxide had any sort of effect on the Earth's atmosphere in terms of warming. This doesn't appear to be the case. Now, that's not to say it doesn't, by the way, um, because the Earth is tilted and that tiny tilt is enough to give us winter and summer, that yes. those extremes in, in climate or weather come about just from a tiny tilt. And I really wonder how, how the flat Earth is kind of get around that, you know. Yep. <laughs> that's, that's yeah. That's a topic for a whole other day. <laughs> yeah. But there's a wobble, and this guy called Blankovic uh, during the First World War and, and after the First World War uh, worked out a, a whole lot of stuff, which is called the Milenkovic cycle. So there yes. are other things which which cause this to happen as well, and we'll deal with that. But But what you can take away from this is that there is some probability that carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere do not appreciably warm the Earth's atmosphere. Mm hmm the, the um, other thing that you should know, and Professor Will Happer, whom I now count as a, a newfound good friend of mine, I love him. Um, I, I, and Will I, Happer is, uh, could you just give a little little sketch of his? Yeah. And he's brilliant, and he's a lovely person to boot. I met him in Brisbane. and He's a uh, physicist, uh, right? Sorry? Uh, he's a physicist? Yes, he's a physicist, oh, yes. And he came up with a really clever way of being able to um, compensate for the uh, diffraction which happens in the Earth's atmosphere owing to temperature, diffraction and refractions that happen. And they upset uh, your telescope 
And he worked out that if he could shine a carbon dioxide laser up into an ionic layer in our atmosphere, it would create like a lamp. And by using that, he can then, using the way it distorts, he could then change the curvature on a telescope and and so compensate and you end up with a much clearer vision as a consequence of his work oh wow okay yeah, lovely fella. so i'm i'm you know i went I, I i wrote to him at first or rather he wrote to me first off and then uh, because i'd written something and then um I wrote back and backwards and forwards, and I, I felt honoured to be talking to somebody, uh, you know, as uh, as eminent as uh, yeah. Professor Will yeah. Papa. And when I met him in Brisbane, I said, look, I've, I've actually had a tilt at politics. I ran for the seat of Ballina, and I'm considering running for the seat of Richmond, but I am concerned about my age. I'm 72. And Will said, hey, I'm 82. What's wrong with you? So, <laughs> Come on. Step up to the plate. <laughs> The sort of he is. He's a lovely person. Yeah. Now, uh, oh, uh, sorry, sorry, but just, just flick, uh, yeah, there's something I just wanted to point out. You may be digging into this later on, but um, those those four green highlighted uh, uh, segments representing yeah. the, the the Minoan warm period, the Roman yeah. warm period, the medieval warm period, and then the modern warm period. Oh, you so- are you are observant. Uh, Robin, well, well done. I, I studied ancient history in high school, and I found Minoan culture absolutely fascinating. And so, what what's really interesting about this is you see that when when the temperature, I mean, obviously this is this is temperature of the Greenland ice sheet, but I I take it that this is somewhat generally representative of of global temperatures. So, if the temperature at the Greenland ice sheet was elevated during these periods, we could reasonably expect that the temperature elsewhere would be elevated. Oh, Correct. absolutely. That's Lockray's yep. law of atmospheric ther- uh, physics, by the way. I just invented it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, and of course, I mean, these, oh, no. the, the medieval <laughs> warm period is is well known among historians. Yeah. Um, and, um, and what's very interesting is that whenever you see these temperature spikes, they're associated with, with a flourishing of human human culture um so, so there's a great increase in you might say the 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 both the economic wealth and also the cultural wealth of human beings and then yeah. in the cooler periods in between this is where you generally see you know civilizational collapse um you know uh plagues for instance uh between so in that big dip between the roman warm and the medieval warm period uh there you know, th- there was there was cultural and social decline, and also an increase in the rate of of, of, of deadly plagues and infectious diseases. So again, um, what we're being told is that with the warming of of, of the planet, um, again, something you'll be getting to in a little while. Uh, is it warming or cooling or whatever? Where's that headed? Uh, where what we're being told is that this will lead to more infectious diseases, and yet if we look historically, we actually see the opposite. So humans right. flourished when it was warmer. Um, exactly there right. was civilizational collapse and more disease when it was colder. Yes, yes. And and the point that Will Happer makes is, and, and quite rightly so, is that the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere does not linearly affect um, radiative uh, warming, you know. So, uh, and, and that's why exactly. if you go from 260 to 280, it's quite significant compared to going, for example, from 280 to 400. It, it is like almost a logarithmic change. Mm. I so, believe there is there is a saturation effect too in terms exactly, of yeah exactly gotcha. yeah all right so we'll, and, we'll get to that. It, okay. it, that you know we could go off on a, I was only having discussions with physicists the other day on exactly this point and there were numerous very long and lengthy emails flying backwards and forwards as we discussed oh, the issue. I'm, again I'm I, I'm putting my I am putting my um. Uh, my devil's advocate hat on because the criticism that you often hear uh, of of people like like Will Happer is well he's a physicist he's not a climate scientist so he's not an expert on this and so what what is your response to to critique? my response is that climate uh, science is is multidisciplined. It involves paleontologists geologists Professor Ian Plymer somebody whom I absolutely I think he's fantastic. He's terrific. Uh, he's got a great sense of humour and he is, an, I, I would have loved him to have been one of my professors. Uh, Professor Will Happer, Professor Richard Lindzen, Professor Willie Soon, 
uh, Professor Doctor, um, and I, they're all Professor Doctors, but I, to give them their their uh, nominals, uh, Professor Valentina yeah. Darkova, with whom I've corresponded, um, they're all fantastic people. They're all experts in their particular area. Uh, one very interesting person is Professor Doctor Arthur Vitorito, who is down in Florida, and he is an expert on. Uh, uh, submarine volcanoes, uh, under ocean volcanoes. Yes, 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 yes. Which have a huge yes. impact on 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 carbon dioxide levels within the oceans, correct? Yeah. And then subsequently in the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, so, and um, it um, just, yeah. To summarise this, um, climate. You know, the idea of climate science, or like climate science as a discipline, is a, is a relatively recent invention slash innovation and 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 so as you say you know there are many branches of science that that actually uh, bear on um, our understanding of, of of how how earth's climate functions okay good 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 all right so i i i, I apologize for sort of keeping on dragging you off track but but I, I suppose you know i'm viewing this from the point of view of the audience and and trying to to answer as many of the questions that might be popping into their heads as as I can while we're going along with this. So, apology for breaking your flow. <laughs> Over you, to you. Absolutely. That no, I'm, I really am enjoying this. Okay, and that the thing that will happen, and many other have pointed out that with this increasing concentration of carbon dioxide in the world's atmosphere, we've seen an incredible increase in plant leaf area, and and I'll drop back to here. Now, you notice at the top of that curve, we have lockdown. That When that happened, basically international travel ceased um, and all industrial activity, especially in the Western world, ceased. And yet you'll notice that the gradient of increase of this carbon dioxide curve didn't falter at all. And what that points to is that mankind's contribution to the Earth's atmospheric con uh, CO2 concentration is minuscule. It, it's tiny. It's If we were to shut down everything as we did in COVID, it will make not a jot of difference to the rate at which carbon dioxide is increasing in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, I'm I, going to play devil's advocate again, because oh. this, this is this is the rejoinder to this that I have heard, that, that a, a relatively short shutdown of the global economy, such as occurred during lockdown, is simply not long enough uh, for for. Uh, to, to show up in, in terms of, of the concentration of, car of atmospheric carbon dioxide. And the reason for that is that we've already gone past planetary boundaries or, you know, we've exceeded certain limits or whatever, and therefore we'd have to sort of shut down the economy for much longer than that to, to see a meaningful change in atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration. What would be your response to, to that criticism? Well, firstly, that's absolutely wrong, and it defies mathematics. The second is that this is a queue. You've got carbon dioxide molecules arriving in the queue, and you've got someone sitting in a little box giving them a ticket to let them get into the stadium, right? Now, the length of the queue is the concentration of CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere. If all of a sudden um, the people arriving at that queue stop, e.g. that's mankind's emission, stop you know, adding to this queue, then the queue will immediately shorten, provided that the consumption, you know, the rate at which they're being issued their tickets to get into the stadium stays there. And that brings us to the next point, which is this. The leaf area has increased by at least 11% between 1982 and 2015. We're now seven years, eight years down the track from there. So I'm guessing that the leaf areas most probably increased by something like 15%. The rate at which a plant consumes carbon dioxide is a function of its leaf area. In other words, the plants around the world are now consuming carbon dioxide at 11% or 15% greater rate. In other words, the ticket guy, you know, we've now got a lot more people issuing tickets to the queue of carbon dioxide turning up for the games. And yet the graph isn't decreasing. And by the way, an increase of 11% consumption is three times supposedly what mankind is adding to the queue. So in other words, we've already gotten to net zero and gone beyond it. We're mm. actually in the negative territory if you're talking. Now, this is, this is actually a little bit of sophistry too. I'm, I'm being very simplistic. In reality, a 
forest, which is in status, in other words, steady state, is consuming as much carbon dioxide as it is emitting. And in fact, you will find that the concentrations of carbon dioxide recorded by satellites are highest over forests, not over the sea. Okay? That's because oh, that's fascinating. Off the tree and they rot and animals eat them. And there's, yep. there's fungi and all sorts of things. Any, there's a constant any, cycle, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if it reaches steady state, having a forest does not reduce your carbon dioxide. So when the Greens say, oh, we shouldn't be doing logging in state forests, they're mm. actually totally anti-science because you will cause new trees to grow if you had a policy of, look, we're going to actually go into this forest and take three out of ten in a stand trees. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and more we will establish fire trails um, and fire breaks and we will carry out uh, hazard reduction and if we do that the wild animals won't get exterminated by a hot burn and the trees won't be badly damaged by a hot burn. In, in fact so many of Australia's trees actually require fire in order to be able to propagate themselves. Yeah absolutely it, it, our, our landscape has evolved to rely on fire, especially the acacias. They need a fire yes. to break the husk yes. of the sea. Yes, 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 yes. Otherwise, the old trees are going to die without ever having, exactly. you know, produced the, the seed exactly. for new ones. Yep, yep, gotcha. But, but my yeah. point is that we should be energetically pursuing competitive logging of state forests. Mm -hmm. We should do it for the environment. If you believe mm. carbon dioxide is causing global warming and we must re we must reduce global uh, warming or, you know, carbon dioxide emissions, which, by the way, I don't. But um, if you believe that, then you would passionately believe in going in and taking three trees out of ten where you're not going to hurt the forest. It'll still, you know, all the animals will still have their habitat and so forth. You would passionately believe in protecting state forests against hot burns. You mm. would put all mm. the mechanisms you could to make sure that we don't have hot burns and that the wild animals are not trapped. Yeah, but yep. they don't. So essentially, you're you're clearly clearly you're you're opposed to to clear felling. What what you're saying is that we should be selectively logging, um, both for but yeah yes. for for, for yes. hazard reduction, for preserving habitat, um, and, and encouraging the growth of new trees. And um, I will just as an aside, uh, in an area of state forest about oh I don't know ten fifteen k's down the road from me, um. The, the large area of state forest has been clear felled in order to put up, can you guess? A solar farm. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. you couldn't make this up. You, you really can't make this stuff up. Yep. I so they've knocked they've knocked down, they've clear felled, way. they've clear felled it's, the trees. It's yep. desecration. Yep. Truly, it's astonishing. And what, what amazes me is that this incompetent government, and I'm talking of Liberal, National, Labor, Greens, these... The Uniparty, yep. Could, ...could actually pull this off. Yep. They, they are destroying this country. You bet. They're destroying it. Yeah, and they're accelerating the, the pace of oh, yes. destroying it. It is, uh, it is just absolutely crazy. So so bottom line here is is that we have seen this greening of the planet. And I've seen plenty of those of those photos taken from, from satellites where you know the area of Earth's surface is actually covered by forest has increased and not yes. decreased. Now that that's not to say that there that there isn't you know catastrophic logging taking place in in many really sensitive areas, but but the fact is you know the area of Earth's surface that is covered by by you know green by plant materials has actually increased, and so again you know if if uh, these rising carbon dioxide levels are so terrible for for life on Earth, how come we got so many more plants? Yes, yeah. <laughs> so this right. is. Happened, oh, crop. here we have it. Yes, crop yeah. yield. Mm -hmm. this, this, I mean, the world, in terms of staying off starvation, um, it, it's wonderful. We, okay. CO2 has increased. Now we're, now we're getting into the last 140 years. In fact, this is 108 in this case. Their uh, climate uh, measuring stations around the US, which are of long standing, and most of them have not been encroached upon by urban conurbation, by urbanisation. 
And Which is really important because of the urban heat island effect. Exactly. And I know that there was a paper published on that recently. So, yeah, but, but if you've got a weather station out in the middle of freaking nowhere and, and, and there's there's no sort of built-up area that's distorting the temperature record, then then we, we can be quite trusting of temperatures that are measured at, at such stations. And this is an interesting analysis in it's the percent of days above 95 degrees Fahrenheit for the years 1917 to 2017, all at US historical climatology network stations. And my my best wishes go to Tony Heller, who is a who's amazing. He's he's a terrific guy. He's he's talented, very honest, and you can basically bank on his data. He's he's actually really good. funny too. <laughs> I, mean, I enjoy Tony's. Uh, yeah, very much. I enjoy him very much. sense of humor. <laughs> okay, so once again, here we have NASA data uh, from Durban, South Africa, 1885 to 1995. Trend downwards. Sierra Leone. You can see where it is. I've I've actually deliberately put the where each one of these is next to the graph so that the uh, viewers can see what's going yeah, on that's super helpful uh, it's also so so you know um anyone who's looking at this is going to notice there was this big temperature rise in the late 30s and those of you who've uh, perhaps read some some um american literature from that time uh might remember the or, or you know, you've read about the oklahoma dust bowl and how yes, yes. very high temperatures during this period really just drove a whole lot of people out of the american midwest yeah um yeah, and so I, I don't think I, I don't think that 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 temperature uh, that temperature rise in the thirties was quite as extreme in 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 other countries. Or um, do you do you want to just scroll quickly back through those charts? Because I did notice that there was a peak around the nineteen thirties in several of those. Yeah, yeah, that around. No, so the- we do we do yeah we do see it in South Africa, but their eighteen nineties were even higher, yeah. right? Yeah, interesting. Yeah. They, okay. they are affected by ocean currents. Yep. Uh, that yes. that have an effect okay. on your local uh, climate. Um, yeah, yeah. And then this is, but by the way, that ocean currents um, influence, as well as the um, the um, Milankovitch or Milankovitch, whatever uh, cycles is, is like to to try to simplify climate down to to one factor, CO two, is. Um, uh, Again, I was going to say something that, that's considered offensive these days, but I don't know what the hell I'm just going to say. It's really retarded <laughs> to, to say yeah. that something is, as complex as Earth's atmosphere can all be boiled down to CO2 when you've got things like these these cycles and then the uh, the, the ocean what currents. Anyway, so, yeah. Yep. 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 So, so that for the benefit of those who can't see what we're talking about, at Sierra Leone, the temperature trend is downwards from, 19, from 1885 to 1995. Yep. Similarly, down in Antarctica from 1960, mm-hmm. which is when they started recording to 2020. Yeah, the cold in Antarctica. Wow, eh? Yep. 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 And then if we go to Brazil, uh, Quixara Mobin, um, 1896 through to 2009, the, the trend is steadily downwards. Now, this is the Australian uh, Bureau of Meteorology and uh, written re- records extracted from the Australian archives and you will see that the temperature trend is downwards, but there's a sharp uptick in 1998. And a beautiful, wonderful lady, very intelligent, Dr. Jennifer Maharasi, has written four papers that I know of talking about how Australia's temperature record is now broken owing to either the incompetence or the duplicity of the BOM. The Bureau I mean, Malcolm of... Roberts has been raising hell about this in the yeah. Senate. But... And now there's another fabulous guy. Somebody mm. it, it, I would count him as a as a friend. He's a, he. I am so pleased he's in Parliament, and I'm he's so disappointed a... that Craig Kelly didn't win his seat. That was a yeah, yeah, yeah. We're point. very very lucky to have someone with an intelligence and and just and just the. Sh- Sorry, um, I think we've got a delay. We're very, very fortunate to have someone with both the intelligence and the energy of, of Malcolm Roberts. He's, yeah, uh, he's yeah. like a, you know, energizer bunny. Yeah. yeah. All and right. Now, so what are we looking at here? Well, uh, what I'm showing you is that the BOM decided, in its wisdom and quite rightly, that it would move from an analog system of measurement across to a digital, which would allow it then to reduce its cost whilst improving its accuracy. But when they did that, they reduced the size of the what are called Stevenson screens. These are boxes in which the instrumentation is stored. And by using a smaller box, you end up with a warmer temperature. For many years, 
I was under the misapprehension that they had not run the two systems in parallel. It turns out that they had, but they don't w- wish to release the results of that parallel test. Right. So so they they do know. I mean, the fact that, that they will not disclose that information indicates that they know there's a discrepancy between the old and oh, yeah. digital yeah. systems, and they don't want to release that to the public. Well, under freedom of information, they've been forced to, and you guessed it, it there's a substantial and significant difference between the two measuring systems, which makes it then very difficult to do a trend analysis. However, I'm sure that those persons who are honest We'll, we'll be able to work it out. I certainly could mm. if I open the data and the time. Mm. Okay. There's one mm. I'm up to also. <clears throat> the blue line is the real raw temperature data, and the red line is what they have done by way of what they call homogenization. Homogenization involves taking temperature readings which are in suburbia and therefore are hotter than natural and adding them to those which are in the country and you become then homogenized, which is rubbish. Yep. They yep. should only again. Use this is yeah. This, so this is contaminating, contaminating with the uh, with the urban um, um, heat yeah. island effect. But you might notice there's a trend here, and that is that the BOM seems to have been infiltrated by people who are bent on trying to show that there is global warming and yep. that we should reduce our emissions of carbon dioxide. Mm, 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 it's mm. Very dangerous. For, for okay. reasons which will become evident, um, low-cost, reliable energy is the foundation stone of any modern prosperous society. Yep. And the reason the communist Chinese are so overjoyed at what's going on in the West is that we are destroying ourselves to their advantage. Absolutely. Advantage. You can see that in a very advanced state in Germany now. So Germany has gone from, you know, the industrial and and therefore economic powerhouse of, of, of Europe to, you know, it's teetering on the brink of being a failed yep. state. And yep. I, I noticed that there, there were recent elections in you know, the former um, um, East Germany and they uh, they've had it up to the back teeth with with the you know the crazy greens and and the left wingers and they're starting to elect parties uh, who are running on a platform of saying you know we're we're reversing all of this we we you know we want our country back we want our reliable power sources yeah, back yeah yeah now, these guys are working for the communists and they're either working deliberately for the communists that is to say they've been paid off by third parties. If I'm running, you know, the People's Liberation uh, Unlimited Warfare Cell, what I would organise is for people in the countries that are my target uh, to pay somebody. They would look around for a group that is uh, advocating for climate change yep. and I would slip money into them, but I would even be cleverer and do it to minor groups who would then pass the money on to a major group or participate in a major group. In other words, I have yep. numerous cutouts so that people Absolutely. don't know to. I, I know this is happening in the US via, via the Tides Foundation. So the Tides Foundation is like a pass-through where all of these uh, uh, tax-exempt foundations like the Rockefellers and the, you know, the uh, George Soros's, um, what's what's his mob, the um, Open Society Open, Foundation. Open Society, yeah. yes. They they use the Tides Foundation as a pass through, and then the Tides Foundation, you know, doles the money out to all of these organisations that that then you know conduct disruptive you know, protests and and um and, and, and as as well as well as just the you know the sheer lobbying power as well of of because uh, I mean some of these organisations are more supposedly grassroots, but in fact they're astroturf. Um, and and then you've got so much of of, of this this foundation money um going into lobbying and so just just to um just to go back to you know, one element of my kind of waking up to the whole climate thing which I didn't mention before was um the reason that I I, I accepted the narrative for such a long time without really looking into it was that the, the the heuristic that I applied was there is an incredibly wealthy industry um namely the well the set of industries really the the uh, you know, gas, coal, um, oil industries. And the, the general pattern that, that we know from history is really wealthy industries uh, lie and and lobby and and cheat and wrap politicians around their little fingers to, to get their way. And so, um, again, my, my heuristic was big industry, um, uh, the climate change narrative is clearly against the interests of, of that industry. Uh, therefore, 
I can I can probably rest safely in the assumption that the climate change narrative is the correct one because it opposes industry. And then, of course, you find out, well, no, as a matter of fact, these, these wealthy industries are actually funding <laughs> so many of these, you know, climate activist organisations. And then you're like, whoa, hang on, what is happening here? That just broke my heuristic. <laughs> yeah. the, the, um, you have to look at BlackRock and Vanguard, um, yeah. less Berkshire Hathaway, which uh, is... Um, uh, what Warren, Warren Buffett, Buffett. Um, yeah, Warren Buffett and so. uh, Bill and Melinda Gates. So they, they're opportunists. The latter, latter two are opportunists. But um, Pink, Larry Pink, is is strongly linked with the Chinese Communist Party. Yep. And uh, Vanguard and BlackRock actually championed a uh, a huge propaganda campaign against Peabody Coal in the United States. Mm-hmm. drove the share price right down and then went and bought up all of Peabody. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. It's, <laughs> it's, a, it's so unbelievably cynical. And then, of course, you know, yeah. Larry Fink is the champion of, of, of all this ESG scoring. Yes, and so they'll, it's, it's, you know, they'll, destroying, they'll... it's destroying companies. Yeah. And you've yeah. got little leprechauns like Alan Joyce who ends up heading Qantas and has virtually destroyed Qantas. I mean, yes. what has Qantas got to do with the Aboriginal industry? What have they got to do with gay pride? You, yeah. you look at everything that Qantas has been involved in and it is destroying yeah. Qantas. I, I, If I can, I try not to fly Qantas. Yeah, uh, because, same. Uh, same. My, my, my father was a flight engineer for Qantas, you know, back, yeah. back when they had 747s that actually needed flight engineers. Um I always always mock pilots by saying, "Yeah, my dad was a flight engineer." You know, back when planes didn't fly themselves. Um, <laughs> anyway, that really offends them. Um, but but yeah, your know, Qantas was was a great company, and it's just been absolutely trashed. I mean, you know, the service is 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 terrible. The reliability has gone to hell, of course, since they you know offshored the the servicing of the planes. Um, and then you've got people like Alan Joyce who are just destroying the culture of of, of that yes. you know, once mighty and and great company. So, yeah, it's sad. I I I, I don't like Qantas. I just you know. well, I was only reading today that a pilot had a serious medical episode uh, as a consequence of of a uh, COVID injection. You I don't it's happening everywhere. But yep. once again, uh, Qantas was really, really rabid. Uh, Graham Hood, whom I really admire, has yeah. kicked up a lot of fuss. But it was the stupidest thing on earth to go and inject our pilots with an experimental drug. And I tell and you what, I, I no longer feel all comfortable of the people about, who about flying commercial. In, yeah. uh, in the, the Civil Aviation Authority. What the listeners may not know is that I left the Civil Aviation. I was the head of maintenance support for the Civil Aviation Authority, mm-hmm. and I actually left because I was I was not happy with the direction that management was going, and I predicted that there would be a serious accident if they didn't you know, get on top of stuff, uh, yeah. and subsequently they did have that. I appeared on ABC, and, uh, and the CEO was invited to leave uh, the uh, CAA, but that really didn't solve the problem. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, the, uh, mm-hmm. So, so we've got idiocy at all levels. We have caused all of our policemen to get injected. I know I've gone off the off the track, but but this gives you an idea of what's happening in our society. We these, we are these issues are actually interwoven. They really power. are. Yeah, yeah. 